Hi everyone, welcome to Volcano Tuesdays. Thank you so much for joining us this week. My name is Gina and I work as an educator with the Mount St. Helens Institute. We are a nonprofit that teaches about the science and stories of Mount St. Helens, and we work to inspire the curiosity and questions that you have about volcanoes through this series called Volcano Tuesdays. Each week, Volcano Tuesdays includes a live demonstration of an activity for you to do at home, and each week we ask you to complete some challenges on your own. Submit photographs, videos, and other artwork that you create, and we will showcase each week on our Volcano Tuesday page. Tell us what makes you curious about volcanoes, because the questions that you submit to us inform what we do each week. We had some amazing submissions to our Volcano Tuesdays this week. Let's showcase a few of them. First, we have this poem that came from Donald. Donald wrote a poem using the word volcano. You can see that on the side. The poem reads, very ominous lava can annihilate new omnivores by a very intelligent child named Donald. Thank you, Donald, for contributing. Our next submission comes from an amazing woman named Louise Anderson in Vancouver, Washington. She took Sonia's ash challenge to heart and created a very detailed plan for how Vancouver, Washington can mitigate the effects of ash from a future potential eruption of nearby volcanoes in the Cascades. We can see that Volcano Girl saves the day. And at the end, at the Portland Airport Control Tower, it says, we're prepared. Thank you to Volcano Girl. Thanks so much, Louise. Finally, we had an amazing submission from one of my favorite volcano friends, Silas. Silas has an amazing volcano jacket here. It's hard to see that these are all volcano patches. Silas submitted a video of himself doing Alyssa's ecological recovery uh, yoga moves, and I want to play just a short snippet of that video for us to enjoy. Then, and, and then I saw whooping flowers and, and going and, and waving in the breeze. Then, then out came by to eat those flowers. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. Uh, and then and they left scat. Uh, and then outer uh, and then alder trees began to uh, uh, grow, spreading out their branches. Uh, and where there's trees, there's woodpeckers. Peck, 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 peck. In this series, we are learning about volcanoes and volcanic eruptions through the example of Mount St. Helens in Washington. In 1980, Mount St. Helens had a large and explosive eruption, which blasted apart the mountain and buried the old growth forest that used to cover the northern side of the volcano. Today, the area that was affected by the 1980 eruption remains different from much of the surrounding landscape of the Pacific Northwest. Let's look at what the land might have looked like from the view of a bird after this big eruption. We'll begin by taking a look at some satellite images. These pictures are part of a project funded by NASA called the Earth Observatory Project. Special thanks to the team at NASA for publishing these photographs for us to use and examine. So what do we see in these photographs? Mount St. Helens is the tall volcano in the center circled here in red. We can see the crater that's at the center of the volcano. This crater was formed during the 1980 eruption. Next, we can see an area clearly distinguished by a lack of green plants and trees. This large gray area looks this way because it is gray, full of rock and debris blasted out from the volcano during the 1980 eruption. During this eruption, Mount St. Helens blew apart sideways, blasting rock and debris 17 miles to the north. Can you trace an imaginary line around the area affected by the 1980 eruption blast? Here's how I drew my line. We can clearly see the area affected by the 1980 eruption. Let's take a look at another photograph. 
can we still see the boundary of the area affected by the 1980 eruption as clearly? This photograph was taken after the other photograph that we just looked at. Can you guess what year this photograph was taken? Remember, the eruption happened in 1980, and the last photograph we looked at was taken in 1987. In this photograph, we can see that the blast area is full of many more green trees. How many years does it take trees to grow back? This photograph was taken in 2016, 29 years later. What else do you notice that's different between the two photographs? Here again is the outline that I drew from the 1987 photograph of the original 1980 blast. Look at how much greener the area is. We see that the area with inside the red is much more green. That is because some of this is trees that were planted. Some of these are trees that have grown back naturally. Yet even 40 years after the eruption, trees are still beginning to grow as we get closer to the volcano. And we can see that a large area is still gray colored right in front of the volcano crater. Also, the color of the trees is different. We can see that the color of the trees closer to the volcano are more lime green, and the color of the trees further away from the volcano are more dark green. That is because this represents two different types of trees. The lime green trees are trees that grow more quickly, trees that lose their leaves like cottonwoods. And the dark green trees are trees that grow more slowly, trees like evergreens, like fir trees and pine trees. And those trees take longer to grow. So we can see inside our blast zone, while some areas have lots of dark green trees, those were planted, there are many areas that contain lots of lime green trees and those have come back naturally. Over time, the lime green trees may transition to becoming more dark green. A bird flying over Mount St. Helens would see a view similar that to that of the view we see in this satellite photograph. What might you be looking for as a bird flying over this mountain habitat? You might be looking for a home, a place to build a nest and to raise a family with plenty of food to eat. We call the places that birds live habitat. The 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens created brand new habitat for birds and other plants and animals to live. This habitat was different from the surrounding habitat and so it drew and continues to draw a unique set of birds and other animals and plants. Today we are going to learn about some of the birds that make their homes at Mount St. Helens. When the volcano erupted dramatically in 1980, the deep old growth forest that covered the mountain slopes was blasted away, buried with ash and volcanic debris. This created a brand new land on which plants and animals could grow and live. Birds were some of the first animals to return to Mount St. Helens to make it their home. Today we are going to learn about the birds that have made their home in the new landscape created by the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. Some of these birds reside at Mount St. Helens throughout the entire year, and some come to nest during the spring, summer, and fall seasons. Spring is the season in which many birds sing, and early June is an excellent time to listen and learn bird songs. Migrating songbirds flock to nest in the rich habitat surrounding Mount St. Helens and fill the air with a chorus of birdsong. Today we are going to learn to identify Today we are going to learn to identify and draw some of the birds that make their home in Mount St. Helens. You can draw along with me or print a coloring worksheet with the drawings available on our website. You can follow along or pause the video to gather your supplies and work on your drawings at the same time. Here we go. As we draw each bird, I'm going to play the sound that each bird makes in the background. These audio recordings are collected from people around the country who record birds and create a free database of bird sounds for all of us to learn from and enjoy. Today, we are going to learn about the birds of Mount St. Helens. We are going to do this by drawing. 
Let's begin by drawing Mount St. Helens. The volcano has a flat top and a dome of lava in the center. I am going to use watercolor paints to color in my volcano. You can use whatever coloring supplies you have, crayons, colored pencils, or other art supplies. This is going to be our title page. Here are some birds. The first bird we are going to draw is the Wilson's Warbler. This is a small yellow bird with a short head, short beak, and very round wings and a round tail. The male has a black patch on its head. Let's label this bird, Wilson's Warbler. Warblers are a family of birds named for their distinctive songs, like a wa waterfall. Now, let's color in our little warbler. Let's start by coloring the head, bright yellow. This bird is almost entirely yellow, with slight greenish color on its wings and on its tail. Wilson's warblers live in the young new trees that have grown back at Mount St. Helens since the 1980 eruption. We'll give it some nice yellow color on the tail. Our next bird is called the Western Tanager. Let's find it in our bird book. Here it is. This bird has a long, narrow body with a small head and a small tail. It has long wings as well. Let's give our little friend a label. Again, this bird is called the Western Tanager. Western Tanagers are very distinctively colored. They are very fun to see. They have a bright red-orange head. and a yellow body. With black wings and a black tail. Though they are so brightly colored, these birds are hard to spot as they like to hang out in tall treetops. Like the Wilson's Warbler, they make their home in the new trees that have grown back at Mount St. Helens since the 1980 eruption. These birds have two white stripes on their wings. I'm going to leave these two areas white as I color the rest of the wing in black. Tanagers, like the warblers, are migratory, which means they come to Mount St. Helens in the spring, summer, and fall to nest and raise their families. Our next bird is the chestnut-backed chickadee. Let's find it in our bird book here. This is a small bird with a very round head, short wings, we'll draw these wings here, and a thin, narrow tail. They have black patches on their heads and a black bib underneath their chin. Let's label our little chickadee. Chestnut. Chickadee. These chickadees migrate up to higher elevations in the mountains during the summer season. 
There's one type of chickadee that is common at Mount St. Helens. Let's give it the rusty red color that gives it its name. They have gray wings and a white patch on their head and chest. These little chickadees like to forage at the ends of branches of trees. Our next bird is the white crowned sparrow. This is a bird slightly smaller than a robin with a long tail. Let's pull up a picture in the bird book for reference. White crowned sparrows dominate the open habitat at Mount St. Helens. They make their homes in bushes and shrubs in the area without many trees. There are still many of these places without trees around Mount St. Helens. To help camouflage in the bushes, these sparrows have many complex markings on their wings and head and are colored a mix of brown, tan, black, and white. They get their name from the white patch on their head. These birds like to perch on the tops of bushes and broadcast their song and their territory loudly. They are very common in the open habitat of the blast zone created by the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. These are complex birds to color and draw. Well done. We're going to draw a final set of birds. The next bird is called the common nighthawk. This is a bird that soars in open skies, it loves open habitat, and eats bugs and other mosquitoes in the air. It has broad wings shaped much like a paper airplane and patches of white on its wings and tail. Nighthawks get their name because they swoop in the early evening skies, eating mosquitoes and other bugs. We can see the picture in the bird book that nighthawks are often seen flying in the air. They, like the sparrow, have complex colors, but often all that one can see when seeing them flying by are the white patches on their wings and tail. Up close, the nighthawk has many lovely colors. Our next bird is called the spotted towhee. This bird is colored black and rust. It has a distinctively tall head, long legs, and makes its home in bushes and shrubs. Toeys like to be low on the ground, and their call, often emanating from deep inside a bush, sounds to me like a cat. They have a very long tail, and their tail usually points upwards. Let's draw this tail. Spotted toeys have made a home in the low-lying bushes and shrubs that have grown back at Mount St. Helens. We'll begin by coloring in this bird's head black. Here is its name, the spotted towhee.
They are easily spotted by their black head and then the rust red color of their bellies. Tohis that live in the West Coast or the Western United States have bright red eyes as well. What we'll color in their eye red? The wings and tail of this bird have white spots, giving it its name, the spotted towhee. Otherwise, the wings are colored black. These birds have long legs and I've drawn it in a hopping position because they often are hopping along the ground. Similar to sparrows, they prefer to live in open habitat without trees, perching on low bushes and shrubs. Our next bird is called the horned lark. This is a less common bird that is unique to the blast zone of Mensing Hounds. Horned larks get their name from a small protrusion of feathers that stick out from their head. These birds are larger than a robin and have a plump body with distinctive black bands on their throat and head. Similar to the sparrows and the towhees, they prefer to live in open habitat. They are colored tan and yellow colors to camouflage with the habitat where they make their homes. These birds have come to make a home inside the areas affected most dramatically by the 1980 eruption, where still today there are no trees growing. Orange larks are exciting to see because they are a bird that lives primarily in the desert lands on the other side of the mountains. We are excited to have them here as residents in the new landscape created by the 1980 eruption. The final bird that we will draw together today is the raven. These are some of the most intelligent birds and established homes quickly in the area affected by the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. Ravens prefer to live in habitat higher in elevation than their cousins, the crows, which dominate more in our cities. No visit to Mount St. Helens is complete without seeing the raven. If you notice one raven in the sky, look for another. They are often in pairs. Ravens form pairs and mate with their pairs for life. Some pairs have lived at Mount St. Helens for many years, some over a decade. We'll color our raven in as seen from the sky as a silhouette in all black. They have broad paddle shaped tails and wings where you can see the individual feathers at the ends. With this drawing of the raven, this completes our set of the birds of mounting hounds. By illustrating our birds, we hope that we learned a little bit more about what these birds look like and also how they behave. The shape of the birds, the shape of their beaks, their coloration reflects their lifestyle. I hope that when we get to visit Mount St. Helens, we can look for some of these birds, and some of them live in some of our very own backyards, both on, both on the western coast of the United States and some on the eastern coast. So keep your eyes out for these birds in your own neighborhood. We've posted a guide to some of the common birds, plants, and animals at Mount St. Helens on our Volcano Tuesday page for you to download in case you visit this summer or fall. Well, I am so excited to feel better acquainted with some of the birds that live at Mount St. Helens. Sometimes though, it is hard to see these birds. Often we can hear birds without seeing them. We can learn to recognize the different sounds that different birds make to help us better understand which birds are around us. Late spring is an excellent time for bird watching and bird listening. 
Many birds are setting up their homes, and this means many birds are singing loudly. Why do birds sing? Well, just like people, it is their mean of communication. Birds sing to showcase their homes and territories, to attract a mate, to warn each other of predators. Let's listen to what Mount St. Helens sounds like during the spring. This is an audio clip recorded of the birds that make their home on the north side of Mount St. Helens, near Coldwater Lake. This recording was captured in June. quite the beautiful chorus of bird song. It may be difficult at first to recognize different bird songs, but just like the songs of people, the different personalities and styles of speaking will become familiar over time. Finally, we are going to take our illustrations, cut them out, and hang them on our windows. Many thousands of birds die each year by crashing into windows that they cannot see or when they see their reflection in the window. By hanging our illustration onto the windows, we both get to see them and we will make our home safer habitat for our neighborhood birds. Our challenges for this week are for you to send us some of the drawings you do of birds that live at Mount St. Helens or to draw either some of your favorite birds or birds that live in your backyard. Cut out your drawings and hang them up on your window to help protect birds from colliding with your windows. Take a picture and send to us through the form on our website. We will showcase your drawings in future Volcano Tuesday programs. Let's cut out our birds so that we can hang them on our windows. By hanging the illustrations on the windows, we can help protect birds from flying into our windows. Birds often cannot see the difference between the reflection through the clear glass of our windows and many thousands of birds around the United States and other places in the world die from colliding with windows. You may have had a bird collide with a window in your house. We will cut out all of our illustrations, tape the back of them, and put them on our windows to protect birds. Let's find a nice sunny window to hang up our bird illustrations. I have placed scotch tape on the back of each bird and I'm hanging them so they shine in the light. Seeing the names and colors of the birds will help me remember them. I'm spacing my birds relatively close together. The scotch tape makes it easy to move the birds around. You can have fun with the creation that you make on your windowsill. I am hanging these birds in my kitchen so that I will be able to see them when I'm working and eating. Ta-da! An ornament. We at the Mount St. Helens Institute are excited that you were able to tune in for this episode of Volcano Tuesdays. We work to inspire curiosity about Mount St. Helens through field trips, outdoor school, and summer camps. Consider donating to us to support this programming into the future. A huge thank you from all of our supporters and partners. We partner with the U.S. Forest Service, the U.S. Geological Survey, the Cowlitz Indian Tribe, Discover Your Northwest. We also are supported by an amazing set of volunteers and participants in our programs like you consider donating to us to help us keep these free online programs happening. Thank you again for tuning in for Volcano Tuesdays, and we look forward to seeing you soon.